In October 2011, as many of you know, uh, the Occupy protesters came and uh, camped outside the cathedral protesting against um, uh, the way in which uh, global capitalism had set itself up to benefit uh, the few rather than the many. And uh, the cathedral um, was extremely bothered by the presence of um, the protesters and eventually decided that it was going to uh, evict them or, or uh, uh, call on the police to evict them. And I resigned. Uh, I thought that was uh, not the sort of thing that a church should be doing. Uh, and I resigned in the middle of this crisis without any sense of what it is that I would going to be doing next. And it was an extremely tough time. In fact, I, I didn't know how tough it was going to be in the weeks and the months ahead. I went to go and see the, the Bishop of London and he said to me, there is a job going for you. I want you to go and look at, I want you to go and look at a job in Liverpool to go and be the Dean of the Cathedral in Liverpool. And so that day on a, on a windy, rainy February, I got on the train to Liverpool and um, it, it felt an extremely sad and lonely day. I don't know anybody in Liverpool. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those people who, who sort of exists within the M25. Uh, it felt almost like uh, I, I didn't know any friends there. I didn't know anything about it. And I got there terribly early. I always get to places early. I was sitting there having a cup of coffee and a cigarette. And I realised I had one distant connection with Liverpool, which was that my great-grandfather's brother was the minister of the Princess Road Synagogue for 40 years, it turns out. I knew absolutely nothing about him. But it's in Toxteth uh, in Liverpool, very close to where the cathedral is. So I decided to just get a taxi up there and bang on the door. And extraordinarily, there was a, um, a caretaker there. And the caretaker, I said, um, does the name Samuel Friedeberg mean anything to you? And she called me in and said, come and have a look at this. And there in the little museum they have at the side of Princess Road Synagogue is a huge oil painting of my great grandfather's brother. And I looked at this painting, this painting looked at me and something moved inside me that it's impossible for me fully to describe. And I left the synagogue and I sat down at the side of the road. And for the first time since I left the cathedral, I cried and I cried a lot. Then I went to an interview and didn't get the job. I've written, I am Giles Fraser, son of Anthony, son of Harold, son of Louis, son of Mark, son of Morris, son of Jacob, son of Judah, son of David, all English Jews stretching back to the early 18th century, all Jews that is, apart from me. The ghost I suppose I saw, ghost isn't quite the right word, was a, a, a sense of something that had been lost and forgotten. And that was my family's Jewishness. And the fact that over generations, they came here early part of the 18th century and uh, tried amongst other things desperately to fit in, in response to anti-Semitism. Eventually they changed their name from Friedeberg, some to Frampton, some to Fraser. Uh, many of them styled themselves, even, even my great uncle Sam, who wrote this fabulous commentary on the book of Joshua here in Hebrew. Um, even he looked like he'd sort of come out of a, come out of the Athenaeum. Um, they, they, they desperately tried to fit in. And in the end, um, when the war came and bombs started falling on Golders Green, my father um, was sent to a boarding school in uh, um, Devon and came back with all he knew was Christianity. And that became my family's default approach to the world. And suddenly seeing this Samuel Friedberg, his face, it made me start to think about my relationship to Judaism. Disraeli once described himself as the blank page between the Old and the New Testament. And I sort of understood exactly what he means. And now I live this life, uh, which is rather unusual for, for, a, for a priest. I'm married to an Israeli. Uh, my two boys are 
Jewish. My father's Jewish. We speak Hebrew, me badly at home. And I straddle this divide between Christianity and Judaism. And that's what this book is, is there to explore. It's a painful divide. And it's one that also recalls not just my own sort of uh, a fault line through me, but a fault line that runs through um, what people try and put together often as Judeo-Christianity. Christianity itself has a form of forgetfulness about where it comes from that mirrors in some ways the forgetfulness that my family had about where it comes from. Uh, Jesus had never heard the word Christian. Jesus was Jewish, um, went to temple, um, read his Bible, which was not the New Testament that had never been, had not been written down, uh, wasn't even the Old Testament, that doesn't make sense in these times. And uh, his, his early followers were, were Jewish. And yet in the first few hundred years, this thing called Christianity comes to be invented, which defines itself uh, substantially in opposition to Jewishness. And, uh, and, and in the course of the book charts that I've just written, how Christianity uh, seeks to distance itself a tiny, in tiny ways. Um, and those people who were Jews who followed Jesus ended up being written out of the script. Uh, they become, they start as a sort of uh, the majority, the majority of people who first fo followed Jesus were, were Jews, then more Gentiles comes, then for the, the story follows about how Gentiles gain more of the um, power, more ideological power, then became, more, became much more numerous, and in the end wrote out Jewish Jesus following from the, from the script. They did that in all sorts of ways. Today, in, 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 uh, for Jews, it's uh, Shavuot, it's the, the, the Feast of Pentecost, and that comes 50 days after um, Passover. Um, Passover is where Jesus went uh, to um, to sell it. He went up to, to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover when he was when he was um, when he was murdered by the Romans. But um, 50 days after um, Passover for Jews is today. 50 days after Easter is in about a week's time, and that's because one of the things that early church councils did is make absolutely sure. This is a tiny thing, but terribly important. Make absolutely sure that the date of Easter and the date of Passover didn't coincide, lest Christians confuse their faith for Jewishness. Uh, about uh, uh, 18 months ago, I got to uh, take my son to the River Jordan um, uh, and uh, I baptized him in the River Jordan, uh, almost exactly where by reputation, Jesus himself was baptized. And uh, it's an extraordinary place. It's only just recently, last few years been opened up because it, um, it was a place that was, uh, was a minefield uh, um, between uh, Jordan and, and, the, and Israel. And, um, and in that place, surrounded by my almost exclusively Jewish family, and my son had come out on holiday, so he was there. I baptized my son in this place of great division. Uh, the, the River Jordan is on a fault line uh, and it feels like it's a fault line that runs through me and runs through so many of the world's faiths. And yet the story here is really intended to be not a way of resolving the battles, the historic pain that Christians inflicted on Jews or the ideological tension between the two, but a, a way of thinking through how you might live with these sorts of divisions. Afterwards, um, we went to, um, we went and had food together um, in, uh, in a restaurant in the West Bank. And it was the happiest day of my life. The idea that people could sit together peacefully from different faiths and celebrate each other's faiths. Um, me in baptizing my son, who is also Jewish, only speaking Hebrew. I'm not trying to say that these two faiths can be brought into one because they can't, um, but they can sit peacefully uh, aside each other, I believe. And this is a book uh, that's intended to be 
a sort of hopeful book about how Christianity and Judaism might be related to each other. That Christianity needs to reclaim its Jewishness, its, its historic inheritance, and understand that its relationship to uh, the Jewishness of Jesus needs to be fully reclaimed. It's, um, it, it's been an incredibly emotional journey to have together an attempt to put myself back together um, after that experience of the ghost, um, Samuel, and his face looking at me. Was I a betrayer? Had I betrayed my historic inheritance? Had I uh, chosen the side of the uh, oppressors, uh, Christianity over the oppressed? So many questions used to I was extremely troubled by all of this. And what, I, what I've tried to do in this book is to work through some quite complicated theology to try and bring together uh, into, into a more mutually appreciative conversation. Uh, I, I, I can't do anything but this because um, of my wife, my children, my father. But it's a call for other people to, um, in, a, in a part of the world where heaven knows we can see right now how much pain and trauma there is, and religion is not an innocent bystander to this, to try and work out how religions may be related to each other as good cousins, as good brothers and sisters, and not as adversaries. So that's what my book's all about. And uh, I hope you enjoy it if you read it. Giles, thank you so much for sharing such a personal story and such a timely, um, wonderful message as well for our audience. It was lovely to see you and your book, Chosen, Lost and Found Between uh, Christianity and Judaism is out now. And I hope that lots of people will pick up a copy and enjoy reading more. Thank you very much for being with us. And next, it's my great honor to introduce Alison Bechdel, who it is no exaggeration to say is one of the world's greatest graphic novelists, a New York Times bestseller known for her books, including Fun Home, which was named a best book of the 21st century by The Guardian. She's the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Award, and she joins us this evening to talk about her third and hugely anticipated graphic memoir, which is called The Secret to Superhuman Strength, a, chron a chronicle of the conundrums that we all face seeking our place in the world. We are very, very lucky to have her joining us from America and welcome Alison. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen to tell you a little, in order for me to talk, I have to show you things. So uh, I'm going to begin with a question. Is it possible for people to change, um, or perhaps more to the point, is it possible for me to change? I've been trying to change myself since I was a small child and was fascinated by the bodybuilding and weightlifting ads in my comic books. Especially compelling were these ads for the Charles Atlas program. They told a little cartoon story about a, a weakling who gets his revenge on a bully after building himself up with exercises. Um, and while it might be a little odd that I saw no conflict between being a girl and being a, a he-man, as the ads put it, I think what the ads really appealed to was children's <clears throat> fantasy of being bigger than the adults who ruled their lives. What I wanted was self-determination. At the same time, I was having other experiences of, as a child that took me a bit in the opposite direction. <clears throat> an awareness that there was some larger unseen register of reality that lurked beyond everyday life that I would get a glimpse of when I thought about infinity or when I looked at myself in the mirror so long that I stopped looking like, my, like myself and started looking like an other. Um, but those early glimpses of self-transcendence were unsettling. 
And, and I decided that self fortification was a much better bet. Um, there was much talk in the comic book ads of weaklings who were identifiable by their protruding ribs. I had another game I would play in the mirror, one where I'd hold my arms out to my sides to create the illusion that my shoulders were even wider than those of Charles Atlas. One day at last, I succumbed to this particular ad. Uh, this is where the title of my, my latest book comes from, A Secret to Superhuman Strength. I don't think I need to tell you that when the secret to superhuman strength at last arrived, it was a great disappointment. <clears throat> it was just a highly technical self-defense manual that I could make no sense of. Um, in fact, I felt very foolish <laughs> to have thought I could get superhuman strength from a mail order novelty company, but the idea had been planted. Um, I just had to find out some other way to get it. So over the course of my life, I have pursued many different types of exercise and fitness regimens. And on the surface, that's what this book is about, the role of physical exercise in my life. <clears throat> but underneath, um, it's about my attempt to get back to those early experiences of self-transcendence. Over time, my childhood longing to become physically bigger turned into a longing to be enlarged in a different way, to feel that I was part of something bigger, or at least that I was not <clears throat> trapped inside my small particular self. And I have a sense that this, this longing is linked not just to a personal, but to a political project. Um, I actually grew up to become a cartoonist, perhaps another way that the Charles Atlas ads had been working on me. In my early 20s, I started drawing a comic strip called Dykes to Watch Out For. Realizing in college that I was a lesbian had been an experience of profound transformation. I suddenly found myself outside the bounds of polite society. <clears throat> I had somehow become an other, but that experience um, of finding myself outside the system, uh, realizing that I was one of the others that the system so feared, felt like a really a tremendous gift. Um, that childhood fantasy of the isolated strong man who dominated others got turned upside down as I started to learn about interdependence and community and how to live in a way that focused on the common good. <clears throat> so coming, coming out for me had been an experience of transcendence and enlargement. It filled me with a sense of purpose. Maybe now that I was outside of this thing called the patriarchy, uh, perhaps I could even do some small thing to try and change it. But what I began to realize over the course of the 25 years that I wrote and drew this comic strip was that maybe the system was changing us more than we were changing it, um, which was a bit disillusioning. And I eventually stopped drawing the comics, um, in part because I didn't feel like it, it was quite as necessary in 2008 as it had been in 1983, but also because I'd, I'd gotten interested in another kind of storytelling. <clears throat> Just before I turned 40, I started working on an autobiographical cartoon about my father's death. Um, soon after I rather blithely came out to my parents as a lesbian when I was in college, I learned that my father had been having affairs with other men over the course of my parents' marriage. And shortly after that, he stepped in front of the truck. Um, so writing this book about my father uh, was another kind of liberation of slowly freeing myself from the, the ways I'd been trapped by my father's shame and my mother's fear. <clears throat> fear. Sorry about my voice. I'm having trouble with my voice today. <clears throat> my, I wrote another family memoir after that one. This one was about my mother. Um, this is a scene from my 
childhood where my mom was helping me for a while with my diary entries. This scenario of a, a woman writing down the things I was saying uh, <laughs> became very familiar later in life. This memoir about my mother is also a look at how therapy and psychoanalysis saved me, enabled me to break free of the repressive laws of my family <clears throat> where the, the free flow of emotion had been impossible. Um, this book also became a deep dive into the work of the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott, uh, which in turn took me further and further into the deeper realms of not just myself, uh, but of the self and how ourselves take shape in the earliest days. Um, I've, I've been in therapy for most of my adult life. I recently terminated after 30 years. Um, but it was, uh, it was especially freeing to me to come, start to come to terms with what Donald Winnicott called the false self, uh, which explained the way I so often felt trapped inside myself, inside my own mind. Um, and in doing that, I was coming up against yet another obstacle that I had to find my way around. Um, I feel like in a way I wrote both of these family memoirs in spite of myself. I felt for much of the time like I was trying to vacuum underneath the rug I was standing on. <clears throat> my, my creative process has gone from being something that was once very easy and pleasurable when I was a child to something much less fluid as I've gotten older. So. Um, from coming out to looking at the truth of my family, to telling the truth of my family, to grappling with my false self and struggling not to remain stuck in my head, I feel like I've spent my life sequentially overcoming these various self-imposed obstacles. So the next <laughs> obstacle I encountered, the one I was going to take on in this book, in The Secret to Superhuman Strength, was myself itself. Uh, I had let go of the superhuman strength fantasy from childhood, but in some ways I had just displaced that over time with a fantasy of self-sufficiency, a fantasy that I didn't really need other people. Um, in fact, I might have been a hopeless case if all along over the course of my life I had not also been doing something else, which is getting regular bodily exercise. I pursued many different types of exercise and uh, fitness regimens, and I've exercised for lots of reasons, not just to cultivate strength. Um, I feel like I get all kinds of mental and emotional and psychological and even metaphysical benefits uh, from exercise. I, being someone who has a tendency to get stuck in their head. I find that strenuous physical activity counteracts that. This book proceeds through my life in chronological order. So there's kind of a, a history of exercise trends represented as I try one thing after another. Spinning, weightlifting, skiing, various trendy workouts. I also talk in this book about the way that this, the feeling of working out intensely, the feeling of runner's high or that heightened focus that's a kind of a trance um, is very similar to the feeling of being caught up in a creative project, what people call flow state. Uh, the feeling I remember so vividly from childhood, um, I've been very, you know, as I've been trying to get that back, I've been interested in trying to figure out how creativity works, whether you can control it. So in this book, um, I try to, try to figure that out by looking at the relationship of some other writers to their creativity, uh, including the romantic poets, Coleridge here with William and Dorothy Wordsworth, who spent all their spare time walking in the hills together. Uh, and we're very directly inspired by that landscape. 
the state of creative flow seems also to have something to do with getting outside of yourself, with getting beyond your own limited ego and becoming part of something larger. Wordsworth and Coleridge were big influences on the American transcendentalist writers, Margaret Fuller and Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, both of whom had their own somewhat ecstatic transformative experiences in nature of self-transcendence of seeing that their particular selves were not real. Emerson described it as feeling like a transparent eyeball. And Margaret Fuller, had an experience one day after leaving church. Um, she had this realization that uh, believing that the self is real is in fact the source of all suffering, which is a basic tenet of Buddhism, but I don't think she had been exposed to Buddhist thought at the point when she had this revelation at age 21. Uh, unlike Jack Kerouac, who I also write about in my book, um, as I I've always been entranced by the story of how he climbed um, a mountain in the High Sierras with Gary Snyder. He recounts this in his book, The Dharma Bums. And they have their own kind of transcendent experience in nature. So I also look at, um, over the course of this book, my own sporadic attempts at meditating and studying Buddhism in an attempt to grasp that my myself is not real, but it's it's rather slow going. It's nothing like the psilocybin mushroom trip that I had in my youth. <laughs> On that day, I really got it that um, my own self is not real, but um, an illusion, and that once freed from it, I was no longer separate from everything else in the universe. And it was the best feeling I ever had. Um, I'm going to have to, <laughs> I'm going to jump ahead because I, I didn't quite time this and I'm running out of time, I can see. Um, let's just end here. Um, here I am with my happy childhood creativity. Um, I as I try to access these, these feelings of spontaneity and flow, um, sometimes now I, I do that through running, through exploring the woods around my house. Sometimes, uh, quite literally, I will try to engineer flow by sticking my head under a waterfall. Uh, and what I learned from this process is that uh, apart from all of my dogged efforts to change, uh, which seems so often to just turn into more elaborate ways of resisting change. Um, the trick is to just stop trying to control everything, to stop trying altogether and just be. You can just get, all you can do is get out of the way and let things happen. All right. Alison. Thank you so much for being with us. It's such an honor to be able to join you on your explorations of identity and creativity and what it is to be human and to see your incredible images. Thank you so, so much for being part of 5 by 15. And we hope that you will join us again in the future. It was really, really terrific. Thank you for that one. Thank you so much. And now it is an honor to introduce Timothy Garton Ash. He's the author of 10 books of what we, could call the history of the present, which have charted the transformation of Europe over the last half century and include groundbreaking books, free speech and the magic on um, the magic lantern. Timothy is joining us from Oxford, where he's professor of European studies and he's a columnist for the Guardian. And, um, and he's gonna be talking tonight about an article that he published in Prospect magazine, which is about the future of liberalism and the challenges that we face today in the world. And it is a huge honor to have him with us. Over to you, Timothy. Thank you very much, Daisy. And um, hello, everybody. I'm so sorry I can't see you or hear you or respond to your questions or comments, but there we are. Um, ich bin ein Berliner, probably the most famous German phrase in the English language next to Vorsprung durch Technik. President Kennedy, Berlin, uh, 
just after the building of the Berlin Wall, early 1960s. When I say Ich bin ein Berliner, I mean it slightly differently. I mean, I'm an Isaiah Berliner. Uh, ever since I read the essays of the great English European thinker, uh, uh, liberal thinker, Isaiah Berlin in the early 1970s as a student, I've been a liberal, a lifelong liberal, very boring politics, no dramatic changes from left to right, just a liberal. But when I say liberal, I don't mean voting for the Lib Dems. I mean small l liberal, liberal in a much broader sense. So if you think that individual liberty is probably the single most important political value, if you think that everyone everywhere in the world has an equal right and should have an equal opportunity to be free, to be authors of their own lives, and if you think liberal democracy is the worst possible political system apart from all the other systems that have been tried from time to time, you're probably a liberal, small l liberal. And of course, it follows from that, there can be liberal conservatives, liberal social democrats, as well as liberal liberals. And by the way, also illiberal liberals, but that's another story. Now, it turns out with hindsight that the early 1970s was actually a good moment to set out as an English European liberal. When I first traveled to Europe in the 1960s, most European countries were still dictatorships. But starting in the early 1970s, across something like 30, 35 years, you had the most extraordinary spread of liberal democracy and uh, liberal systems, starting in the former fascist dictatorships of uh, uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece. Then, of course, in Central Europe, the story I witnessed and told in, in The Magic Lantern, the Solidarity Movement in Poland, the great changes in Hungary, the fall of the Berlin Wall, then the magnificent Velvet Revolution. I'll never forget standing with Václav Havel and 300,000 other people in Winchester Square in Prague, shaking our keys like that. It doesn't look much on Zoom, particularly if you can't hear it, but I can tell you, if you have 300,000 people shaking their keys, it's an amazing sight. And then spreading across Central, Eastern, Southeastern Europe, country after country becoming democracy, Slobodan Milosevic being toppled in Serbia by the Serbian people, culminating in the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004-05. And at that point, it seemed quite realistic to think that liberal democracy would continue to spread. Uh, Turkey seemed to be going in the right direction from a liberal point of view, Hong Kong, Taiwan was just becoming a democracy. Even mainland China was moving in the right direction. India. But then the tide never turns overnight So in politics. So it took a few years. But somewhere between 2005 and 2010, the global tide turned against liberalism and liberal democracy. And ever since, we faced what might almost be called a global anti-liberal counter-revolution. Xi Jinping's China is now a neo-totalitarian regime, brutally repressive in an area like Xinjiang. Opponents of Vladimir Putin in Russia find themselves mysteriously poisoned or disappeared. Turkey is again a dictatorship under Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Inside the European Union, Hungary is no longer a democracy. And in Poland, liberal democracy is very seriously being eroded. Precisely the two countries that led the way out from communist dictatorship towards liberal democracy are now leading the way uh, 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 to, away from liberal democracy. And even in our Brexit Britain, there have been moments of really serious challenge to liberal values and even to liberal democracy itself. And the question is, what should we 
liberals, liberals in the broadest sense, do about this? That's the subject of, of my essay in Prospect uh, and to some extent of the book Free Speech. And my answer in two words is we must be self-critical fighters. So there's a, an old calumny about liberalism, which says that liberals are always weak, feeble uh, compromisers, appeasers and trimmers. They never stand up in, and fight. In fact, there's an old joke that a liberal is someone who can't take their own side in an argument. Completely wrong. Liberalism at best is and has always been a fighting creed. And so the first thing we have to do is to fight. If someone denounces our independent judges as enemies of the people, a phrase, by the way, that descends from Robespierre via Joseph Stalin to the Daily Mail, we have to fight. If the government tries to prorogue parliament for five weeks at a crucial moment of national decision, we have to fight. If a French school teacher is brutally, brutally murdered, simply because he showed a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad in a class on freedom of expression, we have to fight. And we have to do the same for the English school teacher who received death threats as a result of doing something similar and for other threats to free speech in our universities and elsewhere, fighting peacefully, of course. But we also have to be self-critical fighters. Self-criticism is one of the great strengths of the, of the Western intellectual tradition altogether, but particularly of the liberal tradition. Uh, the, the liberal tradition is one of constantly self-interrogating. It's a, an experimental philosophy. Uh, it's trial and error. And there's a lot that liberalism got wrong in the last 30 years, but let me just take one element and talk about it in through the mouth of a great brilliant French friend of mine um, called Pierre Asnar, Roman Jew, um, Romanian Jewish origin, um, lived in Paris, um, the favorite pupil of uh, Raymond Aron, short, bald, domed head and brilliant. And Pierre in 1991, quite early, wrote a wonderful article in which he said, as we celebrate the triumph of liberty and universality, and remember that was a moment of liberal triumph, the early 1990s, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, let us not forget the yearnings that led to nationalism and communism. And then he named those yearnings, the yearning for community and identity on the one side, and for solidarity and equality on the other. And it seems to me that Pierre Asnard there brilliantly identified the two areas, solidarity and equality, community and identity, where liberalism most badly fell down over the last 30 years. And therefore, if we want to renew and reform liberalism, where we have most to be done. Solidarity and equality is not just about economics. So we all know there are soaring levels of income and wealth inequality, particularly in the United States and Britain, and we have to do something about that. But it's also a cultural phenomenon. Great many people in many of our societies, Britain, America, Germany, Poland, France, just felt for too long that they were not even being seen by the liberal metropolitan elites in the big cities, that they were being ignored, and if seen, were being disrespected. Hillary Clinton, the basket of deplorables. So that when the Polish populists talk about the need for a redistribution of respect, I think they're absolutely right. That's exactly what we need. And I, I say this through slightly gritted teeth, but when the Johnson government here in Britain talks about leveling up, that's exactly right. That's exactly what liberals should want. Not leveling down 
has happened in totalitarian systems, but leveling up so that everyone equally has the same life chances, the same chance of becoming authors of their own lives. And as for community and identity, we liberal internationalists, broadly speaking, cosmopolitan liberals, talked a huge amount about the international community. We talked a lot about subnational communities defined by religion or ethnicity or a locality or other orientation. We talked far too little about the national community. That was a great mistake. We actually left the national community to the nationalists and the populace. And we have to reclaim the national community, but reclaim it in a civic inclusive way with a liberal patriotism. So those are just a couple of thoughts, solidarity and equality, community and identity, more on that in, in the books that Daisy mentioned, The Magic Lantern and Free Speech. But let me leave you with one last thought. You might, looking around at this wave of anti-liberalism all around us, be daunted and depressed, particularly if you think that there's a superpower, China, which is a very illiberal but also very dynamic and rising superpower, and I haven't even talked about the climate emergency or about the great post-COVID challenges that my good friend Ian Golden will be talking about in a moment. But let me just tell you that in the early 1970s, the world looked very dark too. The United States seemed to be in a complete mess after Vietnam and Watergate. Britain seemed to be in a complete mess. Um, a basket case, many said, irreversible decline. Um, many thought the Soviet Union was gonna win the Cold War. Many books were published about the crisis of democracy as they are today. And out of understanding how deep that crisis was, came one of the most dynamic periods of liberal reform and liberal renewal. So if we face up to how deep the crisis of liberalism is today, we have a good chance of overcoming it. So please join me in being self-critical fighters for the liberal values so many of us hold dear. And our battle cry can come from Romain Roland by Antonio Gramsci, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Timothy, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. What a true, um, brilliant speech. And thank you so much for this defense of liberalism and rally and cry. And both of those books that you mentioned, Free Speech and The Magic Lantern are of course out now and available and hope people will read more and think more about this insight. Thank you very, very much for being with us. Um, and next, we are honored to introduce Mona El Tahawi, an author and international public speaker on um, Arab and Muslim issues and global feminism. And we're thrilled that she's able to join us this evening all the way from Canada. Her new book is called The Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls, and it identifies seven sins that women and girls are socialized to avoid anger, attention, profanity, ambition, power, violence, and lust, drawing on her own life and her work and the work of activists from all over the world, the Me Too movement and the Arab Spring. This is a manifesto for now, and we're very honored, Mona, to have you with us, and over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Mona al Tahawi, as you just heard. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I begin everything with my declaration of faith, fuck the patriarchy. And as you can tell, Profanity is one of my favorite sins, and indeed it is one of the sins, one of the seven, and I will be telling you later why profanity is one of my favorites. But first, I want to tell you about one week in February of 2018. In the space of five days, I started two hashtags that went viral. They seem to be disconnected, that they have nothing to do with each other, but as I tell you the story, you will see why they're connected and why they go to the heart of my sins. So in February of 2018, I think it was February 5th, I heard that a young Pakistani woman called Sabika Khan had posted on Facebook about being sexually assaulted in Mecca 
Islam's holiest site in what is now Saudi Arabia. And this brought back memories of when I was there, when I was 15 years old, that's one five, way back in 1982, when my family and I, I'm, a, I'm of Muslim descent, my family and I were on the Muslim pilgrimage, the Hajj, which is the fifth pillar of Islam. And I was sexually assaulted twice. And I've spoken various times in English, in Arabic, on Egyptian TV, in my first book, on Twitter, about that terrible experience. And to show solidarity to Sabika, I started the hashtag Mosque Me Too, both to show also solidarity to the black feminist activist Tarana Burke, who back in 2006 first started saying Me Too, and also to expand what Me Too has always meant to be for all women, because in 2017, it began to take on this tone of being rich, privileged, white, able-bodied actresses who were accusing very bravely and courageously and exposing men like Harvey Weinstein and others. But I wanted to have Me Too in the spirit that Tarana Burke had given us for all women. So I wanted to create a space for women of Muslim descent. So I started hashtag Mosque Me Too. It went viral and I heard horrific stories from very courageous Muslim women from around the world sharing their experiences. After five days, I thought, God, I need a break. And my self-care is to dance. And this is before the pandemic, of course. So my beloved and I, who he lives in Montreal, went out to a club in Montreal. I am now 50 years old, five zero. This time around, I'm wearing a tank top and jeans. Back in 1982, during the pilgrimage, of course, I was covered from head to toe with, the, with only my face and my hand showing in what is often called hijab. So I'm dancing on the dance floor. I'm having a great time. I'm trying to just buoy myself up with the music. And I feel a hand on my bottom. And I thought to myself, you've got to be kidding me. This is still happening. I'm 50 years old. When does this end? Now, unlike when I was 15 years old, when I froze and burst into tears, which are perfectly normal reactions to sexual assault, at the age of 50, in that club in Montreal, Canada, I spotted the predator, my predator, my assaulter, because he was the only person walking on a dance floor full of people dancing. And I ran up to him and I tugged at his shirt from behind so hard that he fell. Now I'm sure he was not expecting the woman that he groped to track him down, but I did. He fell and I sat on him and I punched and I punched and I punched. And every time I thought I was done punching, I was not done. And every time I punched him, I yelled, don't you ever touch a woman like that again. Don't you ever fucking touch a woman like that again. And then I was done and this man stood up and he wanted to see who is this woman who just beat the fuck out of me. So he stood up and he made eye contact with me. And I was still so enraged, I smacked him across his jaw. I almost broke my fingers. And he realized at that point that I would start punching him again. So he ran away. I was just, I was like a volcano ready to explode. So my beloved and I went to the bar to have a drink of water. And one of the club managers came up to me to ask what he's like, what happened? And I explained to him what happened. And he actually said to me, why didn't you let your husband take care of it? At which point I was ready to beat him up. <laughs> but I replied, first of all, he's not my husband. And second of all, this is my body. I take care of it. And he looked at me like I was like, like I was a Martian and speaking, you know, a language only Martians speak and just walked away. And it was at that point that I determined to start my second viral hashtag of that week, which is hashtag I beat my assaulter. And again, women from all over the world shared their own experiences. Now, I, before I continue, I want to make very clear, I am not victim blaming because I know it's very difficult to fight back. There are so many instances when I could not fight back. And I'm also, my priority is that we survive. But what I was doing by talking about beating up that man and starting that hashtag is claiming my right to self-defense and claiming my right to violence. And that went, that was the story that one of the, in, the inspirations for the sin of violence. Because I realized when that club manager asked me, why didn't you let your husband take care of it? That what he was basically saying is that patriarchy 
enables and protects men who sexually assault women. And, and in my book, the title is Women and Girls, by, but I include queer people. So trans women, trans men, non-binary people, gender queer people. The title for, for the sake of brevity is Girls and Women. So it's essentially anyone who's not a cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied man. So patriarchy enables and protects men who sexually assault women. And patriarchy will only allow other cisgender men to fight against those cisgender men who attack us. Meanwhile, we are supposed to just stand there and you know, our bodies are to be attacked or defended. And when I talk about that, people are often at a loss about what I mean when I speak about patriarchy. Patriarchy is that when you ask, when you talk to people about patriarchy, it's like asking a fish, what is water? The, the fish is like, what are you talking about? What is water? Because water is, it's everything. So the point I make in my book, The Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls, is that patriarchy is like that. Patriarchy is everywhere. Patriarchy is the very air we breathe. So in order to continue my aquatic analogy, analogy, analogy <laughs> I want you to imagine an octopus because that octopus is the perfect way to explain what patriarchy is. I want you to imagine that the head of the octopus is patriarchy and each one of the tentacles is one of the forms of oppression that together work to privilege male dominance. Patriarchy is not about men because there are many, women, there are many men who are hurt by patriarchy and there are also some women who benefit from patriarchy. So what I do in my book is I give you sins that I believe will help liberate us from the tentacles of that octopus. So one of them is violence. Another one of them is power. And the, 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 sin, of, the sin of power is to challenge that question, that, that facile statement, we need more women in politics. And I want to know what, what women do we need in politics? Because I don't support a woman merely by virtue of her being a woman. I support women who dismantle that octopus called patriarchy, not women who uphold it. And um, the other sins, as you heard at the beginning, are anger, um, attention, um, lust, and also the sin of ambition. And what I love about the sin of ambition, and it, it was the hardest chapter to write for me, is that it's my ambition to liberate ambition from accumulation, capitalist accumulation, and the accumulation of what I call patriarchy's crumbs, which is why I say I don't support any woman, because there are some women who in return for crumbs from patriarchy will uphold what will help to strengthen that octopus called patriarchy rather than fight to dismantle it. So what I've done with the chapter on ambition is to say that ambition is about being more than not being less than, but not about gaining more, not about having more wealth, not about being a CEO. I want to know what ambition is like is for a working class woman. What is ambition for a black or indigenous or woman of color in a country like the United States where that octopus called patriarchy is most definitely very powerful? What is ambition like for a domestic worker who leaves her impoverished country and leaves her children for her family to look after so that she can go to another country and look after other people's children. Is she allowed ambition? And I had a great conversation with one of my nieces about ambition, where, which I, I believe goes to the heart of it, where one day she said to me, I was looking at family pictures on Google and I found a picture of you. And then she stopped. She looked like she was very wary. And I was like, well, what, what was the picture, sweetheart? And I thought that she had found pictures of me when both my arms were broken because during our, the year of our revolution in Egypt in 2011, Egyptian riot police had assaulted me and broke both my arms and sexually assaulted me. But after some cajoling, she told me that she actually had seen pictures of me being arrested in New York City a year later in 2012 when I was arrested for spray painting over a racist, Islamophobic, pro-Israel ad. And you know, considering what's happening right now, especially the bombardment of Gaza, I'm very proud that I defaced this ad. And I was arrested and I spent the night in jail in New York. And two years, I was going to stand trial for possession of a graffiti instrument, criminal mischief, making graffiti, all this stuff. But after two years, a judge dropped the, the, the charges in the interest of justice. So I took those pictures as an opportunity to talk with my niece about the importance of activism and how I was proud to be arrested. And then she said, she pointed to my tattoos, which I got after I was assaulted in Egypt. And she said, I know why you got tattoos. 
And I said, why? And she said, because they broke your arms and you wanted to say I'm free and awesome. And I said, that's right. And then she said, well, why did they break your arms? And I said, because they wanted to scare me and make me stop protesting and go home. And then she said, did they? And I said, no. And she said, good. And in that moment, I like to think that I passed on a baton of being free and awesome to my niece to show her that you can be more than. It comes with risk, of course it does, because revolutions are dangerous and they involve risk, but revolutions are important. And this is what I want you to think, uh, I want you to consider my book is. My book is a manifesto for feminist revolutions, for destroying the patriarchy. I want you to think of my book as a Molotov cocktail to throw from the barricades of feminist revolution into the belly of patriarchy, especially now as we're emerging from a pandemic that has affected women, girls, and queer people the most around the world, especially the most marginalized of us, disabled women, black women, working class women around the world. And so having passed on that baton to my niece, I, that my book is the baton that I want to pass on to feminist revolutionaries everywhere. And those, so violence, power, and ambition are three of my favorite sins, but I'm going to end with possibly my favorite sin of all, and that is the sin of profanity, because I consider profanity the verbal equivalent of civil disobedience. It tells authority, fuck you, I will not respect you, because your violence against me is more offensive than my saying fuck. The crimes of patriarchy are more profane and vulgar than my saying fuck. And so I present the great Ugandan feminist, Dr. Stella Nianzi, who has actually been imprisoned by the Ugandan dictatorship for being profane. And she is part of what an academic called a tradition of radical rudeness that began in Uganda during British colonization, when British colonizers actually had the nerve to tell Ugandans who were rising up against colonization that they had to be polite and civil. And those Ugandan anti-colonizers anti and activists said, fuck you, essentially. So I take that tradition of radical rudeness and I use it against patriarchy and I use it against white supremacy and I use it against capitalism, transphobia, homophobia, ageism, um, all of those, um, ableism, all of those tentacles of the patriarchy. And I use all of those sins as a form of radical rudeness, as a form of feminist revolution against the patriarchy. And I end my talk hoping that I've inspired in you a feminist revolution in the way that I began. And that is with my declaration of faith. Fuck the patriarchy. Thank you. Mona, thank you so much. That was so inspiring and energizing and really a rallying cry for us all to be free and awesome. And your book, The Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls is out now. Thank you so, so much for being with us. That was fantastic. And now it is a great honor to introduce Ian Golden, someone who I hugely admire. He's a professor of development and globalization at the University of Oxford. And he was an economic advisor to President Mandela, vice president of the World Bank and the founding director of the Oxford Martin School at, um, at Oxford, which brings together over 300 members of the faculty to address global challenges. It couldn't be more important and urgent than now. And in his new book, which is out this week, which is called Rescue, he tackles the challenges and the opportunities posed by COVID-19, and he asks what we should do next. So welcome, Ian, and thank you very, very much for being with us, and over to you. Thank you very much, Daisy, and thank you for including me in this awesome lineup. Uh, the other speakers have been inspiring, and I hope that I can end uh, in a way that inspires the many, many participants that are in this activity tonight. For me, the most important thing that we take away from this pandemic is that we do not go back to business as usual. You've heard from the others this evening as to the many things that are absolutely wrong with the system that existed before. And while we yearn to have normal life, while we yearn to restore what was there before, we need to be incredibly careful that we don't bounce back and not even bounce forward. Because bouncing forward implies we carry on along the same tracks that we've been on, the same road, and that's heading over a cliff. That will inevitably mean 
another pandemic, worse crises, growing inequality, sexual and other discrimination. And of course, it means that we are destined to have a dystopian future, escalating climate change. Even the term reset, which some have used, worries me. It implies we go back to the same operating system that we had before. And as we know, when we reset our computers, that's what the factory put in. That's hardwired. What we need is something really fundamentally different. We need to seize this opportunity to rescue the world, to rescue ourselves, to rescue humanity and create a better world. And that's why I wrote Rescue from Global Crisis to a Better World, because I believe we are at an inflection, a crossroads in human history. We have a choice. This could be the best century ever for humanity. It could be a century where we learn to live together, where we move from I to we, from them to us. It's a century in which we could overcome the wants, overcome and increase the progress that we've seen, overcome all the greatest challenge effects. But it's also a century where we can see the world explode. What the pandemic has revealed and exacerbated is the divisions, the inequalities, terrible things that we've seen and we continue to see, not least now in West Bank and Gaza, but also in India as a result of the pandemic and so many other places. We recognize the precariousness of this moment and we recognize, I hope, that we never want this to happen again. We want this to be the pandemic that ends all pandemics, but in so doing, not only ends pandemics, but provides a portal, a way of doing things that leads to a different world. Am I dreaming? Is my book a fantasy novel? I don't believe so. Because I've gone back and looked at historical examples of where these global crises have, have not led to very significant seismic changes. And perhaps the most instructive is to compare the First and Second World War. As you know, the First World War was an absolutely ghastly war. H.G. Wells wrote it was the war to end all wars, but he's sadly wrong. Bad leadership, worse economic policy, a roaring 20s that led to exuberance, but without caring about the consequences, not least for inequality led to the Great Depression, the rise of fascism and nationalism, and an even worse war. It killed many more people and led to much greater destruction. But remarkably, while the bombs were dropping, literally on Whitehall, the New World Order was being created. The New World Order which created the wealth state through the Beveridge Report 1942 in the midst of the war which gave the promise to those that were going off to fight the war. Those that come back, we guarantee we'll have a better life. Those that come back, the young sacrifices that have been made will not be in vain. We will create a society of full employment. We will give you housing. We will give you education. We will give you much more. And internationally, we will work to ensure that this is the war to end all wars and the United Nations was created. Unlike in the First World War, where those that were vanquished, the losers, were forced to pay reparations and became even more impoverished. In the Second World War, there was a massive generosity. The US gave 3% of its income to reconstruction and especially for those, the Japanese, the Germans, and others who had been on the other side. Bretton Woods institutions, Marshall Plan, the UN created the New World Order, and happily it has been the war to end all wars. The period that followed the Second World War 
was what is known by historians as the golden age of capitalism, 30 years in France, the 30 glorious, the 30 glorious years. And it was a glorious time because it was characterized by solidarity. It was characterized by extraordinary progress in life expectancy, even during the war, because nutrition improved. And it was characterized by very high levels of government intervention. The UK and the US had a race to the top in taxation, 70% in the US marginal taxation compared to 25% now. It was only 30 years later with the Reagan, Thatcher, Cole revolution that there was a race to the bottom. UK and the US, and then followed by others, racing each other to impose a new Washington consensus of low gov tax, small governments, and private domination of markets. We get that time again, and we need to ask ourselves, are we in the first or are we in the second world war? Is this going to be a period where we are able, by seizing this moment, to make big structural changes? And it's not about the leaders. Many people who I interviewed for the book, I interviewed a wide range of people, said we just don't have the leaders. But what's so remarkable about that is it wasn't simply Roosevelt and Churchill that created the conditions for a new world order. It was the demand of citizens. It was the demand of the sacrifice of the young for the old, as has happened now, that this would change. It was the demand of society that this history not be repeated. They had gone, many people, through two world wars. It was a demand to change. And that's why, absolutely remarkably, despite being the hero who had delivered the UK and the Allies from fascism, Churchill was voted out of office by an almost unknown person, a bland person, within six weeks of the end of the war. And it was because Churchill was not prepared to embrace the welfare state. He was not prepared to embrace the fullness of the commitment of solidarity. He lost the election, even though he won the war. And we need to learn from that. We need to learn that society can demand change and does demand change. And we need to learn now, as what's been revealed within our countries and between our countries, provides that capital. We've seen terrible things and we've seen great beauty. We've seen solidarity in a way which we've never seen it for humanity. We've seen people sacrificing their lives, the nurses and doctors that have put themselves at risk, the young people who've given up their social lives, their education, their job prospects, and inherited a massive debt. We've seen governments do things today that would have been unimaginable in January. 2020, whether it's telling us not to fly, telling us this week in the UK we can hug each other again. Who would have thought in January 2020 that governments could tell us these things? Who would have thought that they could say, we won't allow firms to go bankrupt or we will pay a furlough to people? The world changes dramatically. We can change our behavior in dramatic ways. Governments can change what they do in dramatic ways. And of course, there's been unparalleled international solidarity, the vaccine, the collaboration of science, but there's also needs to be much more. The countries that have done well are the countries that follow the World Health Organization's guidelines fast and effectively. Poor countries like Vietnam and Mongolia, when Europe, one of the poorer countries like Greece, the arrogant countries like the UK, like the US, have had some of the highest death rates, even though they have the best science per capita. And of course, the populist, whether it's in Bolsonaro, in Brazil, Modi, Erdogan, and in our country, have not done well in terms of per capita death rates. We need to learn from this. We need to learn the value and the importance of solidarity. And I'm hopeful. I've seen this now twice in my lifetime. I believed I would never go back to South Africa, 
the prospects of change were hopeless. And then it happened overnight. We've seen it, the transformation of many societies, and we're seeing it in many ways in the solidarity that people are showing each other within our countries and between our countries. Much more is needed. But unless we see this as an opportunity for change, there's only one thing that is certain, which is we want to carry down a road which will lead us over a precipice. And so this choice we face, and this choice that we're facing every day, is one which I believe is concentrating the mind. We've had a lot of time to think, reflect on what the pandemic means. And I'm hopeful. We're seeing, and we're seeing it in the US, and we're seeing it in other places, that people are changing their minds. People are reflecting on what's important. And as we look forward, and we think of our future and the future of next generations, we need to ask us a, a question has been asked before by generations, but it's our turn now. If not now, when? If not us, who? If we don't make these changes in our lifetimes, they will never happen. Rescue is a call to arms. Rescue is a roadmap. Rescue shows us why and how these changes are necessary. And I hope that you like me, feel that this is the time for change and that we together can create a better world. Thank you. Ian, thank you so much for such a hopeful and optimistic and timely end to this event that brought together so many of the themes that we have been discussing in terms of solidarity, community, the way forward, and I think our ability to transform as people and societies. And it's a huge honor to have um, you with us um, the week that your book, Rescue, is published. Congratulations. And I hope that everyone listening will get a copy of Rescue, which is out now. Thank you so, so much to all of our incredible speakers, to Giles Fraser, Alison Bechtel, Timothy Gartanash, Mona el and Ian Golden. It has been a tremendous evening, and we are in awe of all the work that you do. I'm very, very grateful for you for coming to speak to us and thanks to all of our participants this evening. We will see you again very soon. Stay safe and well and good night. <laughs>